Hey, so as you can see on the screen, so this is the last in that little kind of lead into Christmas series. So this is the last part of that Philippians 2 um, passage that we've read every week, right? So we've been reading that whole bit um, every week. And I thought I'll just do a quick recap in case you've missed some, which I'm sure no one would have missed any, but just in case you did. So there's kind of three parts of this. So the first part is in verse 6. So verse 6 talks about how Jesus is fully God. And if you remember, one of the big things I had us keep saying was that Jesus is as fully God as the Father is and as the Holy Spirit are. And one of the things I talked about is sometimes, because we often focus more on the humanity of Jesus, because we see so much in the Gospels, some people subconsciously kind of pull Jesus down a little bit. And they're like, yeah, Jesus is God, but the real powerful God is the Father. And it's like, no, 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 they're equal. Right? That's what that verse 6 is saying. And then the next one is verses 7 to 8, which to me is just the most amazing part of the entire thing. And this talks about this, um, the humiliation of Jesus or the obedience of Jesus, um, submitting to the will of the Father and becoming human. And if you remember in those verses, it kind of gets worse, if, in quotes, so like worse and worse, like so um, takes the form of a slave, becomes human, submits to God, and then dies on a cross. And it's just this carrying on. And I had a conversation with a couple of people this week who I amazingly confused last week. So sorry about that. So just to quickly explain, in um, these verses, it talks about how, depending on which translation you're using, but it talks about how he um, Jesus, to be human, he laid aside or he chose not to use some of his divine attributes, right? There's this phrase in there, and it's different in different translations of the Bible, right? And the thing I was spl- explaining was that for him to be able to live fully human, he couldn't continue to use all of his divine attributes. So he stayed fully divine. He didn't, you know, like take off some of his attributes, and now he's not really God. He's still fully divine. But to live fully human, he chose not to use some of his divine attributes. And the simple example I gave was <clears throat> um, a human is in one place at one time, which all of us are very thankful about because that would just get really weird if we are all in multiple places at the same time. Um, but part of Jesus' divinity is that he's omnipresent or he's in all places at all time. So he can't continue to have all the attributes of his divinity. Remember, he's still fully God. So while he's human, he chose not to use the, the fullness of his divine attributes. So he chose to kind of limit himself, you could ch- say, or he, he veiled some of his divine attributes so that he could live fully human. Does that make sense? You're with me, eh? Okay, at least two people are with me. That's all good. Shot. Have you ever said yes? All right. Cool. The key to keep remembering is he's fully divine. So verse 6, he's fully God. Verse 7 to 8 is this, this humiliation, this um, Jesus subjecting himself to the will of the Father. And then we have these amazing verses um, at the end there of 9 to 11, which is this, the exaltation of Jesus, and that's what I'm going to do today. So I just want to read those verses again. I know the amazing and awesome Victoria, who has... Oh, it's still here. Whoa, I thought you were up with John John. Um, no, Emily read. What the heck? Stop confusing me, you crazy Americans. Um, so I just want to read that again. So if you've got your Bible, it's good to bounce over there. If you've got a, a device or something, go there, because it's... I know, I know I say this all the time, but it's the Word of God, so it's kind of cool to... To see it, and I think we absorb it much better when we hear me rambling on and we see it, right? Um, so I've explained those first bits, and here's verses 9 to 11 again. So therefore, and I'm going to talk a lot about what that therefore means. Therefore, God elevated him, or God elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, I love that, eh? One of the things I want us to wrestle with a little bit this morning is how do we find this balance of Jesus being Lord of the universe, the creator of everything, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago, but at the same time, he's totally our friend, right? Which is the other part that Emily read from John 15. So how do we have Jesus Lord? He is God. We submit to him in everything. He is the, the God of my life, the Lord of my life, in like giant capitals, Right? But at the same time, he's not this terrifying, scary Lord. <laughs> at the same time, he's my friend. He literally calls me his friend. He literally calls you his friend. Now, how do we find this balance? And I think a lot of us, myself included, we often err to one side or the other, right? So some of us go too far on the lordship of Jesus and, and, and get a bit religious or a bit fearful. But we forget that he's our friend. But then some of us go too far the other way and we go too far. That he's our friend. He's our mate. Man, when I get to heaven and I hang out with JC, and I'm like, whoa, 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 you're going too far on the friend side. You're forgetting he's also Lord and creator of the universe. And, and we've got to figure out how do we live, like actually live life? How do we pray? How do we, we live life with this balance of Jesus being Lord and friend? Does it make sense, eh? You with me? Man, I'm loving the feedback this morning. It's amazing. 
Um, so just a random illustration. So as you know, when I was at high school, I was not the best student. I was that one that every report card was like, Craig could do better, like everything, right? Hands up, who else said that? Because heaps of us were the same. Yeah, Brett, yeah, heaps of us, right? Idiots in high school. Um, and I spent a lot of time in detention. So now that we're into confessing our sins, anyone else? Like, spend a lot of time in detention? Yeah, nice. See, and you've got tattoos, that's the problem. Tattoo people are just evil, so I don't know. Yeah, totally. So I spent a lot of time in detention, and if you spend a certain amount of time in detention, you're always getting sent to the principal's office, right? My last name is Barrow, and the number of times I just heard in a class or in the playground or getting chased downtown by a teacher because I'd gone downtown without a pass, which I did all the time, Barrow, get to the principal's office, and I'd be like, oh. Now, the awkward thing about going to the principal's office was one of my best friends was the son of the principal which made it super weird. And so my really good friend, Jonathan, um, and we hung out all the time. I spent heaps of time at his house, even went away on a week-long vacation with his family. Um, and so it was this real awkward thing, because you're having dinner with the principal, but he becomes quite a friend, you know what I mean, eh? Because he, he was a really cool guy. But then on the other hand, he was, you know what I'm saying, he's the lord of my life. Because when you're like at high school, the principal, for me anyway, was mildly terrifying, normally because I was in huge trouble. And I remember heaps of times sitting outside his office and feeling just like this kind of quandary because I wasn't going in to see Jonathan's dad, my kind of friend. I was going in to see the terrifying, scary principal. Does it make sense, eh? Right? Um, I just want us to kind of be wrestling with this, right? How do we find this balance of, um, of Jesus being the Lord of our, our life, but he's also our friend, right? All right, so I've got some, a couple of points, just two points this morning. So here's the first one. Jesus is fully God, therefore, right? And I talked a lot about this over the last couple of weeks, so just real quick, I really see this, therefore, at the beginning of verses 9 and 11, as Paul is saying, because of what Jesus did in becoming human and submitting himself and dying for our sins, because he did all that, therefore God has elevated him. Therefore he is now the, the, the king of kings, lord of lords and, and stuff. Does it make sense, are you kind of with me? So just real fast, there's a, another whole view that says, nah, he already had that. If you go back to verse 6, he already had all this. And that's part of what he kind of laid aside, right? That's part of what he laid aside while he was being human. This real glory, um, this, this lordness. He kind of laid some of that aside. And then after the resurrection, he takes it back. But I, I just don't see it. I see Paul saying, therefore, because he um, submitted himself to God, therefore God just really elevates him, right? Um, so that's my understanding. So I just want to look at a couple of verses that talk about um, Jesus being the, the, the lord of the universe, if you like. And like I said before, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is myself, like I've, I've said this a couple of times, right, I sometimes, and I say this real carefully, so don't throw too many things at me, I sometimes find myself associating a lot more with the humanity of Jesus, because I read the Gospels a lot, right, so we have four books just talking about the humanity of Jesus, right, and we see his divinity in there, and, and I sometimes, I don't forget, but I, I connect with him as the, um, the one who walked on the earth, he was tired, he was hungry, he was all this, and I, I kind of get that. And I, and I have to then work, that's where I default to, and I have to work really hard to keep reminding myself, man, this person I'm about to pray to, this person I'm asking to guide me, to strengthen me, to, to convict me of sin, or, or whatever I'm about to say, is also the almighty creator of the universe, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is Lord of all. Does it make sense, eh? Anyone? No. Okay, let's move on. All right. I give up. Okay. So here's Hebrews 12 too. You guys know this verse super well, but we'll read this. Um, sorry, let me find it here. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Okay, Hebrews 12, 2. So we're thinking about this, this glorification, this exaltation of Jesus, if you like. Eh? Verse 2 says, um, we do this. He's talking about us running hard in, in our Christian lives. In verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And there's this real interesting phrase, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. And, and I love that phrase in there, because of the joy waiting for him. And it, most people say it has two meanings. One, and to me this makes me just like bow in absolute worship, one of the, the joy aspects that he was waiting for is for you and me, right? <laughs> which to me is just incredible to think that one of the reasons Jesus went to the cross is because he thinks you're amazing and you are worth saving and you are worth hanging out with and you are worth blessing, which just makes me go, 
man, do you know me, Jesus? Because I'm not that flash. Do you know what I mean? So, so part of that joy is that. And part of the joy, though, is this exaltation, right? This raising up of Jesus as the Lord, where every knee will bow and every tongue confess and stuff. I love that. Okay, here's another one. I'll put this one on the screen. Um, here is 1 verse 3. And I've read this a couple of times through these um, messages. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. And when He'd cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. I always love that last little bit, the majestic God of heaven. So you see this again. You really, to me, you really clearly see this kind of therefore. Because of what He did, saved us from our sins. You see this, this exaltation. Here's the last bit that I want to read. Um, over in Hebrews 7, 23 to 27. So if you've got, it's good to click around, right? Um, and these, these verses to me are a little bit funny. I love, I absolutely love this ending here. So to me, this, this first verse, I always find it kind of funny. I don't know about you. So this is Hebrews 7, um, verse 23. Um, there are many priests under the Old Testament, Old system, for death present, prevented them from remaining in office. And so what he's saying is, one of the problems with the Old Testament covenant is the priests kept dying, because they get, got old and they died, and it's like, oh, so-and-so's getting old, we need a new priest, right? And then he compares them with Jesus, and I just love this next verse. But because Jesus lives forever, because he's God, uh, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore he is able, once and forever, to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Man, I, I just love that interceding thing. Who loves having, and this is really shallow, so feel free to not put up your hand and just judge me. Who loves having rich friends? Anyone? Man, I love, I love my friends, but I love having rich friends. And I think I've told you this. Like, Joseph and I, back in the day, we've kind of lost touch a bit now, but we used to have a couple of friends that were loaded. And so when Christmas came around, their Christmas present was amazing every year. And you're just like... Woo-hoo, thank you, Jesus, for rich friends. And then I think I told you this a while ago too. Um, I went to the States maybe four years ago, three or four years ago, and one of my mates who lives up in Washington, um, the state, is super wealthy, like ridiculously wealthy. And he knew I was coming over, so he wanted to pay for me to go and visit with him. And so he booked my ticket and sent me an email with the, the ticket on it, and it was first class. And I was like, I've never flown first class, and I'm not going to do the hands because I know heaps of you are loaded. Um, I've never flown first class. And I emailed him back and said, bro, I, didn't, I don't need to fly first class. And I think I told you, he texted me back, and he's like, he said, bro, baby, don't fly coach. And I was like, what? You can't call me a baby. What the heck? So anyway, and then it spent like three or four days with him, and it was quite a surreal experience because he is really wealthy. So the restaurants we went to, the car, the, everything we did was like, oh. Was, so I love having rich friends, right? So one of the things, and that's me being incredibly shallow, right? Amen to me being shallow. So good. It's okay to be shallow. Thanks. Um, but one of the things I was going to say is this is where, and I, I got quite overwhelmed thinking about this this week. So f- forget the silliness of my friend. I'm so, I don't even know what the word is. <laughs> I'm so thankful. I'm so overwhelmed that one of my friends just happens to be the creator of the universe. <laughs> He is the one who called all things into being out of nothing. <laughs> he is the one who right now is seated at the right hand of the Father. And if I need anything, I can go straight to him. <laughs> I don't need to send an email to my friend, bro, can you get me a ticket? I don't know. He, he's with me all the time. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, I love that. He mediates for me. Man, I sin. I stuff up. I fight it, but I stuff up. Maybe once a year, that's about it. No. Nah. I start, who, that was way too much laughing. No. I stuff up and I sin, but I love being able to go back to Jesus and just be like, man. I'm so, and he gets it, right? He gets it. I, I love that. I love having not just a rich friend. I love having someone who's the absolute creator of the universe, right? And let me keep reading these. I don't know where I got to. Um, maybe verse 27. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first, which cracks me up, right? And then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice of people's sins. And then jump down to 8 verse 1. Here is the main point. I love how clear it is. Here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. I just, oh, I just love this, eh? I love this. But again, this balance, right? I've got to figure out this balance of he is my Lord and he's my friend, and I can't go too far one way and just live in fear and terror, but I can't go too far the other way to just be like, yo, what's up, JC? I even hate saying that. I hate that whole JC thing. 
Um, so how do I find this kind of balance? How do I find the balance of, of bringing these two together? Um, so a, a silly story to kind of illustrate it. So I have a good friend, Chris, who heaps of you know, right? And so Chris and I have been good mates for about 15 years, and we worked together when I was at the Bible College and stuff. And then about five years ago, I think it was, he, um, he's an amazing worship pastor. And so he got a job over in America um, as worship pastor in this massive church down in Texas. So they're like 12,000 people come to their services over the weekend. They have six campuses, and it's just an amazing place, right? And so Chris got a job as the worship pastor over the worship pastors. So each campus has a full-time worship pastor, and half the worship team is paid as well, and there's all sorts of stuff. There's like three or 400 staff as, as part of this whole church, right? And Chris and I have been really good mates for ages, and as you may know, I'm a little bit silly, shocking, I know, and so is Chris. Chris and I together can just be complete idiots, right? And so I flew into Houston and then drove through the worst storm in the history of storms up to Dallas, where Chris was, and hung out with him for a day. And we were just being New Zealand mates, being idiots and hanging out, because we're really good mates, friends, right? And then the next day, excuse me, the next day I was going to go into the office with him and work from a spare office. And so I went in, and even just driving into the campus, I was like, whoa. Because there's like 300 people. It's like massive. I was just like, man, this is incredible. It's crazy. Um, and then Chris had a meeting, and he was like, oh, bro, it's a meeting with the different worship pastors. Do you want to just come and sit in and stuff? And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. Now, again, and this is super embarrassing, because I'm just an idiot, right? So we get in there, and everyone's, everyone had kind of arrived, but there were still a few people kind of arriving. And I just said some stupid, like, New Zealand thing about Chris being a goose or something silly like that. And all these pastors were just like, oh, bro. And it suddenly hit me, it's like, he's my mate, but at the same time, he is this massive guy. <laughs> like, he's the, the worship pastor over, like, 12,000 people. He has pastor, worship pastors under him who have pastors, who have pastors, who have pastors. And Chris laughed and was like, bro, and laughed. But all these guys were like, <gasps> and it kind of hit me, this, like, oh, my gosh, he's my mate. But at the same time, right now, he's not my mate. He's this really important person. Does that make sense, eh? That kind of awkwardness, right? I don't know. I know the stomp dudes are in. So when the stomp dudes are in, I always want to add in a few more stories. Otherwise, they're like, too many verses, who are you, and stuff. So all good. Hey, so one of the things I, I wanted to, and this is a bit of a side point, but to me this is real crucial, is one of the, the reasons I think that Paul gave us this, um, this example of this incredible humility of Christ and then Christ being exalted is because of what you read at the beginning of the chapter, that we should be humble like Jesus, right? He makes it real clear. And so to me, this, this little point here is real um, crucial. God loves to exalt those who've humbled themselves before him in obedience and submission. You just see that all through the Bible, right? God loves to exalt people who submit, who obey, who submit to the, the guidance, the, the will of God. So here's my scary question, right? And this is a, maybe a bit of a rude question, but I don't know. How are you doing in submitting to Jesus as the Lord of your life? How are you doing on that? Because like I said, we can, we can default to the friend thing. And we know there's stuff that he's, God's calling us to do, Jesus is calling us to do. We read it in the Bible, and we can default too much to the friend. He's my mate. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm not going to. So I just ask you that question. And, and I'm not saying God will exalt you. It's up to him. He can do whatever he wants. This is not a, uh, if you humble God, will be like, oh, my gosh, I better. He doesn't have to. But it's just that simple question. You know Jesus is the Lord of your life, the God of your life, the boss of your life. How are you doing in, in imitating his humility? This is what one of Paul's big points, right? Um, but in saying that, he's still our friend. He loves to bless us, right? And there's this cool C.S. Lewis quote. There's a little bit, being C.S. Lewis, this is a bit of a grunty one, but I love this. And C.S. Lewis is, is just commenting on the love of God and the blessing of God towards us, right? And I love this quote. I'll read it twice, eh? The promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible, and only possible by the work of Christ that some of us, that any of us, shall please God. To be loved by God, and I love this next bit, uh, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work, or a father in a son. It seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory, which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. I, I love that. Let me read it again, because some, some of you have seen it. The promise of glory is the promise almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us, shall please God. To be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in, as an artist delights in his work, or a father in a son, it seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory, which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. I just love that, eh? I love that. Man. 
Mm. All right. So that's that first one, this whole therefore, because of the humility. God exalts him. And here's the second point. Um, Jesus is fully God, and, he, and here we see the real Jesus. And I, I say that carefully. I'm not meaning for a second that the Jesus the disciples hung out with on earth wasn't the real Jesus. But at the same time, because he's, he's choosing to limit some of his divine attributes, it's like he's not the real Jesus. Does that make sense? Because I don't, I don't want to get that wrong. He's still fully God, but because he's not choosing to use all of his divine attributes, it's like you're not seeing fully God, right? Um, yeah, to me, that's, that's pretty important to, to kind of wrestle with. So here we kind of see the, the real Jesus, right? <laughs> um, and I want to read these crazy verses from Revelation 1. I, I'm sure you've read them heaps of times before, but these are, and who was I talking to? I was talking to someone this week, and we were talking about um, this, this hard balance of Jesus being our friend, and he's still Lord and stuff, and how heaps of us don't, we don't click who he really is, right? And we were both talking about this Revelation um, 1 passage. So to, to remind you, um, John, the, the disciple John is Jesus' best friend, right? You guys get that. So heaps of times in the, in the Gospels, you'll see Jesus has got the disciples, but then he's got his inner crew of um, Peter, James, and John. But then even within that inner crew of three, he has his best friend, which is John, right? And you see it all the way through the book of John. John never mentions his name, but he refers to himself as, <laughs> it's like a Skype, the disciple Jesus loved more than the others. But he doesn't say, he just says the disciple Jesus loved. And he's not meaning as a Skype, right? So he's Jesus' best friend. Jesus is his best friend. And they have spent three years at least, right? Walking together, eating together, seeing Jesus do these miracles, hanging out, just and being buds, and I'm sure telling jokes, because Jesus has some pretty funny jokes, and hanging out. And then you go to Revelation 1, and, it, and John sees Jesus now not limiting his divinity, if you're with me. So here's the verse over in Revelation 1. So jump over there. It's good to read this, because it's kind of wild, right? Here we go, in Revelation 1, verse 12. So I'm going to read this, and you got heaps of you know it, right? So he's going to talk about Jesus got um, eyes like fire and his hair's white like wool. Obviously, John's not looking and going, "Whoa, Jesus' eyes are on fire," and "Whoa, he's got really old and his hair's white." He's he's trying to find metaphors to explain what he's seeing, right? He, he can't describe Jesus because Jesus is now so awesome and incredible, and he's kind of struggling. So when he sees like he has a, a long robe. In, in John's culture, someone who wore a very long robe means someone who's very important, someone very distinguished. So he's trying to describe Jesus using metaphor. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Yes, Craig, we're totally with you. Thanks, team. I love this team effort we have going on. Okay, um, verse 12. So John, I'll just read it, right? When, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. And we know from the Gospels that's talking about Jesus because he used that title of himself all the time. And here he goes. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun and all its brilliance. I love that bit, right? But this is the key verse, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. <laughs> Now, a key thing to get in the, in the Greek, which is what um, John wrote this in, he, that he specifically uses words that literally mean, it's like I died. I just collapsed. And I've heard people talk about this, and they're like, oh, he was so overwhelmed by the awesomeness of Jesus that he bows before him. And it's like, that's, he doesn't use those words. He literally means, I saw Jesus, and I was just like, I was just collapsed. It just blew my mind, the, the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. Now, the key thing to keep remembering, this is John's best friend ever. <laughs> but now he sees him not constraining his divinity, right? And the, and the awesomeness of who he really is. And John does not go up to Jesus, as heaps of our youth say, and high-five him and be like, yo, what's up, JC? <laughs> when John sees his best friend, sees the, the risen Lord Jesus Christ and the fullness of his deity, he doesn't even bow before him. He just collapses, overwhelmed by his awesomeness. Amazing, eh? Amazing. But the thing I love, and this is where I'm just like, oh my gosh, Jesus, you're amazing. <laughs> I love this, eh? So I'll read verse 17 and verse 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. And I love this, eh? But he laid his right hand on me and he said, don't be afraid. Now, if you've read the Gospels, he, he just about burst into tears when you hear that, because this is a classic phrase Jesus says again and again and again to the disciples and to other people. Don't be afraid. <laughs> 
I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. And I love the crazy imagery here. You have this image of John for the first time ever seeing who Jesus really is. He absolutely collapses, and Jesus straight away is there. <laughs> right hand. So in his culture, you never touch anyone with your left hand, for obvious reasons. Um, you only touch with your right hand. And the right hand is a, a symbol of real fellowship and closeness and connection. And I love it how Jesus is straight away there, and he's like, don't be afraid. And you see the balance of the lordship and the friendship, eh? It's just like, whoa, I, I need to read the rest. Um, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. That's this lordness, this lordness, the lordship. I am the living one. I died. And look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in the grave. And I, I just love that, the, the beauty of Jesus, the care of Jesus. But that, that Jesus showing him straight away this balance Yes, I am your Lord. Yes, it's right for you to just collapse before my awesomeness, but <laughs> don't be afraid. I'm also your friend. I, I love you. I care for you. Ah, I love that. It's cool, eh? It's cool verses, eh? Shot, team. That was some good mmms. All right. Hey, so a couple of questions for us all to think about briefly. Um, so I'll read these and then we'll have a chat. So do you tend to see Jesus more as Lord or friend? And, and so have a think, who are you going to talk to? Do you tend to go one way or the other, or do you think, no, nah, I've got a good balance, which is awesome? And then the second question, what are some keys to finding a balance and seeing Jesus as Lord and friend? Because there'll be people in here who are like, man, honestly, I always go too far one way or the other. So what would you say to them? How would you help them figure that out, right? So we're just going to have a little chat. So if you're a visitor, this is a bit weird for a church. I don't know. Um, so we're just going to people around you will grab you and we'll have a little chat for two or three minutes. Um, the rule is always if you and God are speaking or if you just don't want to talk to anyone, you just stare at the screen, okay? So maybe God's really moving in your heart right now and you just don't want to be talking to people. Um, if you just stare at the screen, then everyone will hopefully leave you alone. Otherwise, they will pounce on you and chat. So grab a friend or two and we'll just have a little chat about those questions and then we'll carry on. Cool. Kia ora. Hey. Okay, what do you reckon? What are some uh, thoughts from anyone? Either question, eh? What do you think? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's cool, eh? Shot, Louise. That's good. Yeah, that's super cool, Louise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, Louise. Yeah, Jesus gave up his life for us, even for you. Who would have thought? Man, nah. Nah, that's cool, Louise, eh? That's cool. What about that, yeah, that second question? What else would you say? What would be some other keys? Yeah, what do you reckon, Terry? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Cool. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. So Terry's saying sometimes we kind of choose to go one way or the other, but God still has that right to kind of break in and be like, "Yo, no, that's cool, bro." What do you reckon, Graham? Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, eh? That, that's what Joseph was saying too, eh? That balance in reading. If you only, yeah, if you only read the Old Testament and never read the Gospels, <laughs> you get a, quite a different view of who God is. Not that he changes, but because Jesus changes everything. Yeah, that's cool. Have that balance in reading. That's good, bro. Anyone? I was going to say, we have to have someone from over here. Oh, you go, bro. I'm not going to listen to that bearded guy behind you. Walk or your, my, my personal walk yeah. is an intimate um, experience. Yeah, totally. What it designed to want to be. Yeah, yeah. And what breaks that intimacy, and I think it's in any relationship really, like when they mm. what happens, yeah. is yeah. when you step outside those bounds. So although yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, we are loved forever. Yeah. Yeah, the King of yeah, totally. And so when we come to him in this over-familiar area, 
Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. does break that intimacy. Yeah. Yep. And, and so, and you would feel that, and I do. I feel yeah. that in my heart. Yeah, that's cool. But when, when I go too far the other way, mm. um, yep. then I lose the closeness of it. Yeah. And, yeah, um, totally, eh? You know, so it comes down to the, the sense of intimacy. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. So just so the camera dudes can hear. So talking about, it's really the intimacy. How much time are you spending with Jesus? Not just reading the Bible, but connecting with him through the Bible, praying to him, journeying with him. That's really cool, eh? And that keeps that, that intimacy close. That's cool. I love that, bro. Eli, last person, because your beard is glorious. Mm. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. So just so you know, so Eli's saying, and Ashley needs a shout out, um, just talking about how, again, we need that balance, right, which is what people have been saying. So often on a Sunday morning and worship, it's more the, the lordship of Christ. But you need that balance of thinking about him as your friend as well. That's cool. All right. Hey, so I'm just going to finish with a, a bit of a quote. And this, it's a little bit, it's not long, but I put it on the screen because the ending of it's real powerful. And from talking to heaps of you, you process a, a quote or a story way better when you can read it along with me rather than me just reading it. So I'm going to do this. So this is um, Paul David Tripp, who uh, Joel mentioned earlier in the service. And he's a writer over in the state. So I just love this. It's kind of funny, but it's, it's, it's good. Let me read this. And I just put his picture up there because he has the greatest moustache ever. I mean, that's a beautiful moustache. I love that guy. All right. I remember taking my youngest son to one of the national art galleries in Washington, D.C. As they made our approach, I was so excited about what we were going to see. He was decidedly unexcited. But I just knew that once we were inside, he would have his mind blown and would thank me for what I had done for him that day. As it turned out, his mind wasn't blown. It wasn't even activated. I saw things of such stunning beauty that brought me to the edge of tears. He yawned, moaned, and complained his way through gallery after gallery. With every new gallery, I was enthralled. But each time we walked into a new art space, he begged me to leave. And, and this is the last slide. I love this. Whoa. He was surrounded by glory but saw none of it. He stood in the middle of wonders, but was bored out of his mind. His eyes worked well, but his heart was stone blind. <laughs> he saw everything, but he saw nothing. <laughs> and, and just to finish, I think it's, it's so important for us to have this balance of the lordship of Christ and the friendship of Christ. And if you go either way too far, you miss a huge aspect of who he is. And therefore, you miss a huge aspect of who he is in your life. And I've talked about the, the dangers of that. So I just wanted to say, when you thought about that before, do you go too far one way or the other? What are some of the keys? I just want to say, man, it's so important for you to have a really strong, powerful grasp that Jesus is the Lord of your life. He is the God of all, the creator of the universe. The one who, and I love those verses, right? That you will, whether you want to or not, <laughs> at the end of time, you will kneel before him and you will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. You will say that, right? But at the same time, that's not all he is. <laughs> He's also your friend who wants to journey with you and encourage you and support you and challenge you. And we've got to work hard to get that balance. Eh? And I love what people have said about finding that balance. It's cool. Hey, Etu, let's all stand up and let me pray for us, eh? Yeah. Cool, let me pray. Yeah, Almighty God. Um, now, you've seen our hearts this morning, eh? you know us. We're, heaps of us this morning, again, we're just overwhelmed by the sacrifice of Christ. Um, like Louise said, that the creator of the universe would die in our place. It's just it's so humbling, God. We know the sin we do. We know it's our sin. We know we are the ones who should be responsible for it. But because of your love for us, you sent Jesus. Um, and even though he is the Lord of the universe, the King of kings, the one whom everyone will kneel before, even though he is that, He's also our friend. <laughs> Mind-blowing. We can come to him at any time with our, our sin and our struggles and our questions, our frustration, our anger, everything. 
Thank you so much for that, God. Help us to continue growing in our relationship with him. Help us to keep learning more and more what it means to have Jesus Christ as the Lord of our life, who we obey, and, and our friend. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys.